uh, Andy, for those who don't know me here, uh, my name is Eamon Keane and I'm an early career fellow in criminal law and evidence at the School of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm delighted today to introduce Tom O'Malley joining us from NUIG uh, in Galway, where he is a senior lecturer in law. Tom is also a practicing barrister. Uh, his research interests are pretty broad, I would say, but they extend to sentencing uh, and sexual offences. Uh, he has carried out work for the Irish government uh, in respect of the topic he is here to talk to us about today, which is special measures, uh, vulnerable, witnesses, vulnerable witnesses and the right to the accused of a fair trial. So uh, without further ado, I shall hand uh, you all over to Tom. Thank you very much, Eamon, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to join you, even if it's only remotely. Um, I'd obviously much prefer to be with you in Edinburgh, uh, which is always a great pleasure, but uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there will be some other time for that. Um, the topic I'm talking about, uh, say, is about making special provision for vulnerable witnesses, and uh, in particular, how that can be done within the kind of constitutional framework that we have in this country and uh, uh, that indeed would exist in some other countries as well. The reason I suppose that I'm uh, talking to you or have been invited to talk to you uh, is that um, I chaired a working group uh, which operated between late 2018 and the summer of 2020, uh, dealing with that particular topic about special provisions for vulnerable witnesses. Um, could I just pause at this stage and say that people, just to check that people can hear me and so on? Yes? Sorry, I have to unmute myself to say yes, we can hear you. That, that's fine, thank you, thank you. Uh, the, the, I was asked to chair this working group. Actually, the background to it is interesting, I suppose, as an indication of the kind of the sometimes accidental nature in which law reform can actually take place. Uh, the background to it was that there was a very high profile rape trial in Belfast in Northern Ireland in the, uh, at the beginning of 2018, where four men, including two very well-known rugby players, were put on trial for rape. And that caused enormous uh, publicity and enormous amount of public controversy. Now, as it happens, they were all acquitted eventually. But um, because in the North of Ireland, as indeed in England and Wales, and I'm not entirely sure about Scotland, um, you know, the names of defendants can be given from the very outset in sex offence cases, um, because um, uh, also the trial is open to the public. That explained a lot of the publicity and also explained why, unfortunately, due to the social media, uh, the name of the victim was all, or the complainant was also revealed. Uh, now, that wouldn't have happened in this jurisdiction for reasons that had come to earlier on. But it was as a result of that that the government decided that it was time perhaps in this jurisdiction to take a look at the, um, the workings of the criminal justice system insofar as they uh, relate to the treatment of what was called vulnerable witnesses in sexual offence cases. Our remit was fairly narrow in that we were asked to look at a number of topics in particular. And the reason I mentioned that is that um, there was a much bigger exercise carried out in Northern Ireland, which was just more or less coming to an end as we were beginning. Uh, this was a report uh, which turned out to be a major report compiled by Sir John Gillen, a retired uh, Northern Ireland uh, Court of Appeal judge. But he had, been, he had been given a much broader remit, pretty much to look at the entire criminal process insofar as re it's related uh, to the investigation, prosecution and trial of sex offences. So our, even though we had a very, very useful meeting with Sir John Gillen uh, during our deliberations, our report wasn't intended, or our exercise wasn't intended to be at all as extensive as that. So what I want to do is simply to say something about, well, essentially what we were asked to do, what kind of remit we had, and then rather than go into the minutiae of our recommendations, so I'll talk about some of them, and we can talk about them in greater detail, uh, perhaps in discussion, would be to look at the more specific question as to how, as, uh, as to the kind of the constitutional difficulties that might arise in this country in, if you like, providing for vulnerable witnesses. 
first question we had to ask was, well, what exactly is a vulnerable witness? Um, again, we weren't given any definition of that. Um, and I think, to be quite honest, the Department of Justice hadn't given a great deal of thought when they chose the term because they were largely, I think, thinking about complainants section of offence trials, but they used the expression vulnerable witnesses. So one of the things we had to do was to try to um, was to try to find a definition for ourselves. Now, traditionally, as you know, probably the term vulnerable witness is used largely to deal with people who are vulnerable or to describe people who are vulnerable on the basis of youth or mental disability. But it's quite clear that we were being asked to look at something different or more extensive namely vulnerability that can also arise as a result of the nature of the offence and the context in which the trial is taking place. And I just mentioned that because it's, as it so happens, uh, we found tremendous assistance in Scotland, as it happens, that under the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act of 2014, uh, there is a definition of vulnerable witnesses, which we were very, very happy to adopt. And it was on that basis that we proceeded to make our recommendation. The second thing in that regard is that we were asked, of course, to look at provisions for vulnerable witnesses and not just for vulnerable complainants. And of course, a witness can include the defendant because under our system and other systems, the defendant in a criminal trial, it doesn't matter what kind of offense is involved, is always entitled to give evidence if he or she wishes to do so though, of course, they cannot be compelled to do so. And likewise, of course, witnesses could be other people too. For example, in the case of child abuse, well, then other children, perhaps siblings of the victim, might well be called to give evidence, although they were not actually victims themselves, but they too could be vulnerable witnesses. So therefore, we took a fairly broad approach to vulnerable witnesses. Then just to look at the legal background against which we were operating, um, one of the things that we did was to try to draw up an audit of existing provisions. And um, in fact, as far back as 1992, in this country, we introduced an act called the Criminal Evidence Act, which in fact, by the standards of the time, was quite an enlightened piece of legislation, because it provided, for example, that children under the age of 14 could be allowed to give evidence otherwise than on oath if the judge was satisfied that they could give an intelligible account of events, and that still is the law, and there was no, long, no longer any need for corroboration or corroboration warnings or anything like that. The child's evidence could in fact be sufficient to convict uh, an accused person. It also made provision for uh, the, um, uh, for close for, for evidence to be given by live television link from outside the courtroom. It provided uh, that the uh, statement taken by the police from the child when the report was first made, that that could actually be treated as evidence during the trial. It could be, it could, uh, it could uh, be equivalent to what we call examination in chief. And also it provided for other things such as the use of intermediaries, something I'll be coming back to. Um, however, much of this reform had taken place on a, in a very piecemeal way. That, that act of 1992 had been amended, mainly for the better, I have to say, uh, in the 30 years since it was first enacted. And especially, of course, with the uh, adoption of the EU Victims Directive, uh, which was transposed into Irish law in 2017, and various other pieces of legislation. So there was no doubt that, apart altogether from the coincidence of the rape trial in Northern Ireland, that was probably time that we did, in fact, have a general review of our system uh, here in this country. So therefore, at this point, what I might like to do is, since I'm, I suppose you are all interested in this largely from a comparative perspective, and therefore I thought that it might be useful to look at it against the backdrop of the constitutional system that we have in this country, which of course is quite different from the system in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are many differences, obviously, between uh, Irish law and the law of the constituent jurisdictions of the United Kingdom, including Scotland. But one of the major differences is that Ireland has a written constitution, which was adopted in 1937. And I suppose the two salient features 
of that constitution for present comparative purposes is that it does include what might be described as a bill of rights in the sense that it includes a list of fundamental rights for people generally, but also important range of rights for persons accused of criminal offences. And secondly then, of course connected with that, it provides for the judicial review of legislation, uh, which empowers the superior courts to strike down a law that it finds to be incompatible uh, with the constitution. Therefore, in this country, I suppose, when it comes to looking for, you know, inspiration for law reform and looking for persuasive authorities uh, in litigation and so on, we do tend to look both east and west in the sense that we tend to look to England and Wales and sometimes Scotland as well uh, when we're looking for, let's say, uh, comparative authorities on aspects of common law, statutory interpretation and so on. But of course, we look west to North America, uh, the United States and Canada, which have written constitutions like our own when it comes to points of constitutional interpretation. Now, I don't want to overstate the point about looking to other jurisdictions. As time goes by, we have a very significant body of indigenous law ourselves, and that nowadays tends to be what rules. But, um, you know, we still look at, say, like, I think any sensible country should, to see is there anything useful that can be borrowed from elsewhere. Now, obviously, of course, as well, we look to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, and indeed we have, I suppose, if not quite incorporated, kind of <laughs> incorporated the European Convention into our law uh, since 2003. Again, of course, what I'm talking about here isn't by any means, uh, I suppose, alien to a jurisdiction like Scotland or to the United Kingdom generally, in that you know the rights that are protected uh, under the Irish Constitution are also protected for the most part under the European Convention on Human Rights. So again, uh, you know, just as the United Kingdom courts must have regard to uh, that uh, instant that treaty, uh, it's the same way with the Constitution of this country. But what we don't have, importantly, I suppose, is a doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. In other words, it isn't the case in Ireland, unlike the UK, it isn't the case of Parliament being supreme. It's not. Uh, Parliament's powers are limited to the extent that the courts have the power to strike down a law that is, as I say, deemed to be incompatible with the Constitution. So, for present purposes, the most significant provision of the Constitution is Article 38.1. Uh, which will be included. I, have, I will have the text of this included in the uh, text of the paper. And that says, no person shall be tried on any criminal charge save in due course of law. No person shall be tried on any criminal charge save in due course of law. Now, there are 15 words in that statement, and they have given rise to some hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of case law uh, over the past 60 odd years or so. And because it's a constitution that we're interpreting, every word matters. So first of all, it says no person. It doesn't, for example, say no adult or no citizen. And then it says no person should be tried on any criminal charge. So therefore, this is an article or a sub-article that is exclusively concerned with conferring rights on accused persons. It doesn't confer any rights whatsoever on victims or the state or anybody else. And then it says no person should be tried on any criminal charge. So it doesn't matter how trivial or how serious the charge may be or the nature of it, uh, this uh, right applies. And fourthly, then it says no person should be tried on any criminal charge, save in due course of law. And it is this case, that phrase, of course, that has given rise to all the case law. And due course of law is quite a compendious phrase. Uh, it includes not only a fair trial in the sense of a procedurally fair trial, but it covers other matters as well, such as the right to a speedy trial, the right to pre -trial uh, fair pre-trial procedures, and so on. And it is well accepted by now that a person can be denied a fair trial by virtue of what goes before, as well as what happens during the trial. For example, if there was unfairness or illegality on the part of the 
police could investigate the offence. However, it is widely accepted, uh, this is important again, that the concept of a fair trial is a dynamic one rather than a static one. That what it means evolves over time. And the pattern for the most part in this country has to be has been for the judiciary to extend rather than to restrict the range of rights uh, that are necessary to deliver a fair trial. So therefore, what a fair trial meant 30 years ago is different to what it means now. And no doubt it will be different again in 30 years uh, hence. However, that, sec that article 38.1 is concerned solely with conferring rights on accused persons. Um, what about complainants and victims and other people? Well, the constitution isn't uh, by any means, doesn't ignore them by any means. It's just that we have to look to a different article, Article 40, which has is uh, the Article 40, Section 3, which is a very, very important article in that it confers fundamental rights on everybody. So the, it, it's, it, it, it says the state must guarantee to vindicate the personal rights of citizens. And then it goes on to say the state shall in particular, by its laws, protect as best it may from unjust act, and in the case of injustice done, vindicate the life, person, good name, and property rights of every citizen. So the, the rights that are specifically mentioned in it are life, person, good name, and property rights. However, it says that these are the rights that shall in particular be protected by the state. And in one of the most important um, decisions that was taken by the Supreme Court since the Constitution was enacted, which I would say was in 1937, in 1963, in the leading case, the Supreme Court decided that the rights that are protected by the Constitution of Ireland are not confined to those that are expressly mentioned in it, that the courts are entitled to identify other fundamental rights that are also implicitly protected by the Constitution. And it so happens that in that case, the right that it identified was the right to bodily integrity. And that has been the law ever since. So it has elaborated on several other rights as well. So therefore, we have got to a point where, on the one hand, the Constitution um, protects uh, these rights, the, the rights of accused persons in Article 38.1. But on the other hand, it also protects fundamental rights of everyone. Now, obviously, a sexual assault of any kind, whether it's rape or any other sexual offence, is, uh, is a violation of a person's bodily integrity. It's also an attack on the person, which is the word mentioned in the Constitution. And although those attacks, of course, will always have been perpetrated by private individuals, the Constitution imposes on the state uh, a, an obligation to vindicate the rights of the, the person whose rights have been violated, and it does this in effect by undertaking an effective investigation and prosecution wherever that is appropriate. So the question, therefore, is this, um, bearing in mind these two sets of provisions, is how far one can go in making provision for vulnerable witnesses without infringing on the rights of an accused person to trial in due course of law. Um, there's no doubt that this phrase, due course of law, does impose some limits on what can be done. And that has been the experience of other countries as well. Certainly, there could be no question of infringing on the presumption of innocence or on the obligation of the prosecution to prove a case beyond reasonable doubt. But there still is considerable scope. I suppose if one were looking for a good example of where defence rights clashed or took pre precedence over efforts to provide for complainants in sexual offence trials, one might look to the decision of the Canadian Supreme Court uh, in a case called Seaboyer, which was decided in 1991. And this dealt with an issue which, of course, has been dealt with now in most common law countries, including Ireland and the UK, and that has to do with what we call rape shield statutes. These are statutes or statutory provisions that impose restrictions, sometimes quite severe restrictions, on the extent to which a complainant 
in a sexual offence trial can be questioned about their other sexual experience. In other words, any sexual experience they had apart from the alleged offence. I mean, there are some people who say no such question should be allowed whatsoever. Uh, most people would agree that some limitations should be imposed, but they might disagree as to how much. However, what was significant about Seaboyer was that a majority of the Canadian Supreme Court, and bear in mind this was back in 1991, struck down the Canadian provision in that regard because it said that it simply imposed too many restrictions on the questioning of complainants on what we sometimes call sexual history um, uh, to an extent that it could violate the right of an accused person to a fair trial. Now, as it happens, there was a replacement provision very quickly enacted by the Canadian legislature and that did, in fact, uh, was found to be compatible with the Constitution. But it doesn't mean to say that, um, that that is probably an exception. For example, here in Ireland, um, some years later, when we introduced, um, when we introduced uh, in the Criminal Evidence Act, the provision which allowed young defendants and persons with mental disabilities to give evidence by live television link, that was very quickly challenged on constitutional grounds that it infringed or violated the right to confront a witness against you. So it happens that written any such express right written into the Irish Constitution, but it was accepted to be part of the notion of a fair trial. But again, the Supreme Court um, uh, rejected that challenge and they said that yes, of course you have a right to confront witnesses against you, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be what they called eyeball to eyeball. Uh, in other words, you can still have adequate confrontation rights, even though the person you're questioning is in the same room. So therefore, the big question is, to what extent can one reconcile the rights of defendants and witnesses, especially in sex offence cases? I'm using the word reconcile here deliberately rather than balance, because as anyone who has an interest in constitutional law and constitutional theory will know, balancing, constitutional balancing can be quite a troublesome issue. Uh, and of course, even more troublesome still when you're dealing with constitutional due process. Uh, because after all, if you take our constitution here, where, <clears throat> as I say, the article that says no person shall be tried of any criminal charge, save in due course of law, that's phrased in absolute terms. It doesn't, on the face of it, admit of any exceptions or limitations. And in a sense, it has to be absolute. Because after all, there can scarcely be any circumstance in which it would be justified to, to subject a person to an unfair trial. Um, and indeed, any legal process that creates a real risk of a wrongful conviction, it doesn't really serve, that process wouldn't serve any socially useful or ethically defensible purpose. And it couldn't benefit anybody, including victims. So therefore, the real question is this, which is, you know, what is what are the essential ingredients of a fair trial? Uh, what are the essential ingredients of a fair trial? And to what extent are special measures for vulnerable witnesses compatible with a fair trial as thus understood? So I think that when we try to address that question, we have to just look at it. what kind of rights do victims need or what kind of claims are made on behalf of victims in the criminal trial process and especially i'm going to concentrate obviously on sex offenses here and i would suggest that they can be divided into two very broad categories what i would call welfare claims and participation claims now welfare claims really don't cause a problem because we're talking about things like a right to have access to counseling medical attention medical treatment, legal advice, and compensation indeed. And the reason those, these are uncontroversial is that the kind of things that can be furnished to victims without in any way intruding on the accused person's right uh, to a fair trial. And indeed, they can be furnished to victims even if there never is a trial, because for example, the perpetrator might even be, um, might even be identified. So some of the recommendations that we make in our report uh, would fall into this, what I'm calling welfare category. For example, we recommend that every victim of a sexual offence should have a right to legal advice. The right to be able to consult a solicitor 
just for advice on any matters that are concerning them. Um, and that they should be able to do that free of charge, um, that a system will be put in place to provide free legal advice to victims, irrespective of whether there is going to be a prosecution or not. We also uh, recommend, uh, this is happening, that effective information systems should be put in place, largely through the development of websites and so on by the government, so that all victims can access information easily and in comprehensible terms about the services that are available to them, and also about how criminal investigations and how prosecutions unfold. And then a third recommendation we made was in relation to um, provisions for, this, for special training of lawyers, judges, and other professionals who find themselves dealing with victims of sexual crimes. We then come to the more, kind of, uh, I suppose, problematic area of what I'm calling participation rights. And these are a bit more troublesome because they refer to claims that might be made for victims to have some direct personal involvement in the criminal process, you know, whether at the investigation stage, the prosecution, trial, or deep post-trial stages. Um, now, of course, it goes without saying that victims have already got uh, one or two crucially important roles in this regard. For example, the victim, where there is a surviving victim, is all, almost invariably the key prosecution witness in a criminal trial. If the victim isn't willing to testify, generally speaking, that will be the end of the matter. Also here in Ireland, we have had provision since 1993 for victim impact evidence at sentencing. And here, unlike the situation in England and Wales, I'm not sure again of the situation in Scotland, we introduced that by statute. Now, at first, it only applied to sexual offences and violent offences, but it now applies to all offences which inflict injury of any kind on a natural person. Now, it operates at the sentencing stage only. And essentially, what it does is it gives the victim an entitlement to provide evidence to the court, whether in written form or oral evidence or both, and it's very often both, as to the impact which the offence has had upon him or her, and the court then must take account of that when uh, selecting sentence, imposing sentence. Now, again, it's important to say two things. First of all, the victim may not, under any circumstances, make any recommendation as to sentence. That's exclusively a matter for the court, but they are entitled to tell the court in very direct terms what kind of impact the, um, uh, the offence has had upon them. Again, the second point is people often ask, and of course, there are such provisions in many other jurisdictions, there's a lot of research in the area. People very often ask, well, does it really make any difference? Are sentences any different to what they would have been if there were no victim impact statements? The answer, probably not a lot. But of course, victim impact evidence, and especially statements given in court, can serve other purposes as well, in that they give the victim, perhaps at the very first time, simply the opportunity to articulate what they have been through, and very often to address the defendant directly and say, you were at fault, I wasn't. And that there can be a certain psychological benefit in the, um, in the capacity of the, the right to give impact evidence. Of course, the situation becomes more problematic when proposals are made that victims should be able to exercise some kind of influence over key decisions within the criminal process relating, for example, to bail, the mode of trial, sentence, early release from prison. And I suppose to put it in a nutshell here, our situation is that we don't allow, we don't have a difficulty at all about informing victims, keeping victims informed about what's happening, and indeed even allowing them to be consulted on certain matters. And of course, nowadays, as I say, as a result of the European Union Directive on Victims' Rights, which we transposed into Irish law in 2017. This confers extensive rights on victims to have information about the progress of investigations and many other matters. So we made quite a number of recommendations connected with the trial process itself, but we don't believe that any of them really interfere with the due process rights of the accused. I'll just mention three of them. For example, we made 
recommendations designed to reduce as far as possible delays within the court system to ensure also that trials take place within a reasonable time and that they're not adjourned until absolutely necessary. Secondly, like many other working groups, I have to say in the past in this country, we recommended the introduction of a formal system of preliminary trial hearings to allow for certain matters to be addressed well in advance of the trial itself, including, for example, if it is intended to question a victim about other sexual experience. And we also made further recommendations in relation to the use of intermediaries. I'll say something more about that in a moment. So that's just, if you like, giving you the kind of constitutional framework uh, within which we found ourselves operating of the kind of, I don't know if I'd say constraints, but certainly the limitations uh, of which we had to be conscious in terms of how far we could go. So what I want to do next, and I'm uh, conscious of time as well, um, is to just refer to a few specific issues, and I'll deal with these quite briefly, that we addressed in the course of our report. At first, I thought there were many of them, but I just picked out one that I thought might be interesting uh, from a UK point of view, and that is the question of anonymity for victims and defendants in the course of a criminal trial uh, for a sex offence. Now, effectively, in this country, as far as victims are concerned or complainants are concerned, they have a right to anonymity in perpetuity. Their identity may not be revealed. It doesn't matter what the outcome of the trial is, whether it's a conviction or whether it's an acquittal. However, we differ from other jurisdictions in these islands by having a similar right or a somewhat similar right for defendants. Defendants in rape trials and some other serious assault, sexual assault cases are also entitled to anonymity uh, until or if or until they are convicted. If they're acquitted, their identity won't be revealed. If they're convicted, their identity may be revealed unless to do so would also reveal the identity of the victim. Of course, that would often happen in so-called intrafamilial child abuse cases uh, or other cases of that nature, where if you reveal the offender's name, even if convicted, that would reveal the victim's name as well. However, it is accepted, and this sometimes happens, that the victim may, in those circumstances, waive their own right to anonymity, which, of course, means that the offender's name may be revealed. That's one of the big issues that we had to concern, we, we dealt addressed in the working group. There are two arguments, I suppose, in favour of adopting what I might call the English approach or the Northern Ireland approach, which is that, you know, offenders or defendants, I should say, uh, should be named at the outset, as in, let's say, a robbery case or a murder case or whatever. What is, why would you treat defendants in sexual offence cases any differently from defendants in any other kind of case? And secondly, the, the point is sometimes made, and I know John Gillen in Northern Ireland was very strong on this, uh, that if you do name the defendant in a sexual offence case, it may encourage other people, to come, other victims to come forward. We were eventually persuaded by the opposing line of argument, which is that, of course, there can be a very strong stigmatic element to be accused of a sex offence, even if the accusation results in an acquittal. And therefore, we recommended that the anonymity requirements should be retained and that they should apply to all sexual offences. I might add that in our jurisdiction, the, um, the anonymity rights of victims and defendants aren't absolute in that there are some very limited circumstances where a judge can remove anonymity, but that very rarely happens. In fact, I kind of think of the case where it did happen. The second thing that we have in this country is the exclusion of the public from sex offence trials. All our sexual offence trials are held, as the law puts it, otherwise than in public. Nobody may be present except people directly affected. That would be the defence team, the prosecution team, obviously the defendant, the victim, and indeed the victim is entitled to have some support there from a family member or a victim support group. And the media are entitled to be present as well, what are called bona fide representatives of the press. And they may report on the crime, on the trial, but of course they may not, under any circumstances, identify either the victim or the defendant, unless 
after a, a conviction, uh, the offender's name can be um, can be uh, given. And then the other the last substantive issue I'll just mention is the use of intermediaries. Again, that's one of those areas where Irish law was both advanced and retarded in two different ways. First of all, he made provision for intermediaries as far back as 1992 uh, in the Criminal Evidence Act, um, although other countries wouldn't have done it at that point. But unfortunately, we didn't make any provision for actually having them for a few decades after that. And uh, essentially, an intermediary's role is to assist a witness who is having communication difficulties. And that will usually result from either youth, like a young child, mental disability, or indeed physical disability. Somebody, for example, who has suffered a serious brain injury. And uh, at the present time, um, intermediaries can be, uh, are available for vulnerable witnesses generally. And that, again, I would emphasize includes the defendant, because the defendant may be a vulnerable witness. And one of the rights that a defendant has is the right to participate effectively in a criminal trial. Referred there in a footnote to a very good article that appeared in Legal Studies last year, uh, Abana uh, Owusu Bempa, I hope I've got her name right, she's based at the LSE in London, and uh, did a very fine article about um, understanding the barriers to defendant participation in criminal proceedings. Again, she was very adamant or very, uh, a lot of emphasis in the fact that, you know, defendants as well as victims may need special assistance to be able to participate effectively in their own criminal trial. So our system, uh, the existing system, provided for um, victims to be, um, or sorry, for intermediaries to be used for persons under the age of 18 and persons with mental disabilities. The intermediary will typically be a speech or language therapist, speech and language therapist or a clinical psychologist who has uh, expertise in the field of assisting people who have communication difficulties. The law as it stands only envisages intermediaries acting in the course of the trial itself by, if you like, interpreting questions put by counsel to the witness. In other words, counsel would ask a question, the intermediary, if necessary, could intervene and rephrase the question to make it more comprehensible. That can still be done. But when we began to look at the way intermediaries are used elsewhere, in Northern Ireland and elsewhere, we saw that they can have also have a very valuable role pre-trial in terms of assisting at the stage at which the police are taking statements from the victim, because the quality of those statements is always crucially important. You know, the quality of the statement can determine whether the director of public prosecutions will take a prosecution or not. And also, that statement will very often be used as evidence of the trial itself. So again, it's very important that uh, young and vulnerable victims would have the assistance of, a, of an intermediary if needed at, the, at that stage. And again, the other big role that intermediaries can play is an advisory role. And they do that at the present time here in effect, which means that it can usually be consultation or indeed a pre-trial hearing where an intermediary will um, advise both the court and counsel as to any special measures they should take in relation to the way that they address victims uh, and the kind of language that they use. Now, effectively, we have a very underdeveloped structure for intermediaries in this country at the moment. We don't have a register of them. And so our recommendations are quite extensive in terms of introducing a system for the training of intermediaries, the recruitment of a small cohort of intermediaries. We wouldn't need all that many in this country and that there would be a register of. So I just had two final kind of points I was going to mention that at the end, one I have called resistance and engagement because you know some of the recommendations that we made in our report would certainly have met with resistance in the past from judges and lawyers. I'm thinking, for example, about a recommendation for training in, uh, for judges and lawyers on how to deal with the issues that are connected with vulnerable witnesses. Um, and, uh, you know, judges in particular would always have said, well, who's going to train us? So what exactly do you intend to train us in? Lawyers would have intended to say the same thing. 
Thankfully, however, attitudes have changed enormously since then. There was no resistance to that at all. Uh, as it happens, our task was made easier because an act was passed in 2019 called the Judicial Council Act, which mandates the creation of the Judicial Studies Committee to provide education and training for judges. And it includes a non-exhaustive list of matters of which education is to be provided. And these include dealing with victims of crime and the conduct of crime. Insofar as training for practicing lawyers are concerned, we recommended that in the first instance, this should be left to the professional bodies, the Law Society for Solicitors and the Bar Council for Barristers, because both of those bodies already have continuing professional development programs and requirements. And we recommended that special courses should be provided for lawyers who are likely to be dealing in a professional capacity with victims of sexual crimes, and then those responsible for uh, responsible for uh, briefing them, either as prosecution lawyers or defence lawyers, would be entitled to seek information as to whether any lawyer uh, had been um, taken the training. Final point that I want to make, I've called the future challenges. Ever since the report was published, I have been at pains to point out that this is not the last word on the topic with which it deals. Knowledge continues to develop, experience reveals other areas that. Uh, need to be addressed. I suppose if there's one thing, final thing I would mention, which comes to mind as a result of an interesting conference that I uh, saw and uh, took part in this country recently, is about this whole question of trauma. And, you know, what to what extent um, judges should give special instructions to juries on the impact of trauma on victims. I mean, there's no doubt in the world that, you know, victims of sexual crime go through trauma, doesn't matter what the crime is. And of course, in some cases, the experience can be unspeakably traumatic. I'm thinking, for example, of cases where a child has been abused over a very long period, uh, sometimes over several years, uh, and on you know a very, very frequent basis indeed, whether by a family member or anybody else. And of course, it's very difficult even to imagine what that's like. Whenever I have been involved in any of these cases or read about them, I'm often reminded of a phrase by T.S. Eliot in his introduction to a book published in 1946 called The Dark Side of the Moon, which provided a first hand account of atrocities perpetrated against Polish people by the Soviets during the war. And Eliot said that the kind of experiences recounted in this book were ones that victims can record but not communicate. Hannah Arendt later picked up on that phrase in her writing in concentration camps. And what it means is this, you know, that there are some experiences that are so horrific and traumatic that victims may be able to recount them and perhaps to describe them, but they could never possibly communicate to others what it was like to have endured them or to have lived through them. And I fully accept that that can be said about the experience of many uh, sexual abuse victims. There is now a growing level at academic level, uh, a growing interest at academic level at least, in the concept of trauma and the impact that it may have on victim behavior and on victims' recollections of events when they come to report the offenses or to give evidence during trial. And it has been suggested that judges should at least be permitted to give a general instruction to a jury about the traumatic nature of sexual victimization and how this may affect a victim's recollection of events. And this might include observations to the effect that, when considering any inconsistencies or internal contradictions in a victim's evidence, that a jury should be aware that trauma may, to some extent, be responsible for this. So again, I'm not suggesting that this shouldn't be done. I can see, it, I can see circumstances where uh, it may be appropriate to do it. It's something, however, to which we need to give very careful attention because some of the draft instructions that I've seen suggested would almost amount to a direction to convict. So that if we are going to have, if you like, general instructions in that regard, it has to be in the context of, if you like, a very carefully instructed charge to the jury overall, which emphasizes you know, the, uh, the obligation upon them to consider all the evidence uh, and to consider it objectively. So I think I've gone way beyond time, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for, I can, I can see the, the virtual round of applause there for you now. Thank you very much, Tom. That was absolutely 
uh, fascinating. I'm not going to...